time. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful blessing um, on evangelism. And it's not what you thought it was. Not what we thought it was. <laughs> and uh, we're just so excited to have him come and share. And I know he'll share a little bit about himself and his background and a few other things. So, Ben, thank you. Good morning. So good being able to be with you here in New Jersey, and if you were here uh, when another bald guy was around named Paul Martini, uh, I was in touch with him this morning, he's one of my best friends, he sends his love, him and Ruth do, and uh, are excited about what God is doing here, and I'm just, just finding an incredible privilege uh, to get to know your pastors, and uh, I, I'm just really excited about what God is doing in their lives, and and who they are as people. I mean, you think about what God has done in this area and the people that he's brought here, and it's pretty phenomenal. The, the quality of your pastors. And the, in fact, when I, when I was thinking of them, I just felt like their, a real strength in them is their genuineness and their hospitality. Would you guys agree with that? That they, there's no pretense. They're not trying to put on a show. They're just extraordinarily genuine. And that is a breath of fresh air in today's society where things are filled with um, trying to Photoshop every single image and retaking a bunch of photos and doing more takes of this and that and trying to get things look the way you want it to get looked. And it just in a world filled with kind of trying to put on a, a show and make things look like there's something special when in reality, you know, you see these little, these these little commercials making fun of Instagram where uh, it's somebody eating by themselves, but they're trying to make it look as fun as possible. And so they're doing all these setups and doing, you know, and they just take a picture and it's by themselves and you, just, and you scroll back and go, oh, well. But they, they made it look like it was this fantastic thing. And, you know, this world of trying to pretend about things, it's a breath of fresh air to be with people who have no desire to pretend. And helping people come into the genuine love of God and to have a genuine experience in the life that Jesus died for them and give is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? And uh, they have a real gift of hospitality. And I just feel like that's something very strong on this fellowship is uh, being genuine and having a real gift of hospitality over this house. And I just want to thank God for your pastors. I had the privilege of being with them yesterday and stay the night. And, uh, you know, I was having some throat issues, so I called it an early night. And they, you know, they were, but I got to spend some good time with them this morning. And uh, I have just incredibly appreciated who they are, how they carry themselves, and what they're about in this community. I'm going to ask you guys to do something. If you, if, you're, if you can stand, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and put your hands together. And let's thank God for your pastors. You guys stay seated. Come on. Thank God like you mean it. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Embarrass them. Embarrass them. Come on. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Guys, I just want you to know that we appreciate you. Thank you for laying your lives down for the gospel. That you guys are making a significant difference and lives are being changed and heaven wants you to know you're seen. He sees you and he's seen what you walk through. And, and we all know that you guys have dynamics of things you've walked through and challenges that we don't know about and that you haven't even shared with the church and things that are, that are on your heart, but you've held the course and you've kept your heart innocent and pure and genuine before heaven, and God wants you to know you're celebrated. The truth is, church, I'll tell you a little secret of how the kingdom of God works. What you honor is what you release. And let me say it this way, Jesus is Lord all the time. Even if you don't believe in him, he still is. Yeah. But when you believe he's Lord, everything that he carries comes into your life. You see, honor is what releases what someone carries. 
And I have the privilege of uh, working at a ministry school. One of the things that we teach our students is every time we introduce a different teacher to come in, uh, we have them stand to their feet and give an ovation, thanking God for the people that are coming. But we're not just trying to create an environment that is welcoming for them. We're honoring what they carry. Because when we honor the gifts of God, then it's like it opens up. You think about Christmas. That's what opens up the gift when you honor it. And when you honor these two, what they carry in genuineness and hospitality and other things, what that does is it releases that gift to be in you in a greater measure and in this community. And I don't know about you, but I think that we need more genuineness. I think that we need more hospitality. And so we, we want to release honor to our pastors. Pray for them. Thank God for them. Listen, you're not going to be concerned about giving them a big head. And, you know, there's some people who think their job is to make people humble. And that, I just think that's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. A gift of the Holy Spirit is not to humble other people. A gift of the Holy Spirit is really releasing honor to people. It really is. And so we thank God for you guys. It's not my sermon. Just want to, they're not paying me to say that. I just really <laughs> want you guys to know that they really matter. And uh, I, I just feel that there's something over this fellowship uh, and over this, over this community, over this church. And that's two things. One is uh, God wants you to make Jesus famous. There's, there's a, a move of the enemy to make Jesus infamous. But I believe that God is raising up this house to make Jesus famous. So here's your two point things. One is to make Jesus famous and the other is to make people seen. Have you ever watched a movie where they had these blue people on it? I think it was called Avatar. Maybe you didn't see it. But it has, one of the, in this movie, had these aliens that would look at each other and they would say, I see you. When I watched that, it just really stuck out to me. And I feel like there's something on this house where you have people live their lives. And one of the, the needs built into humanity is the need to be seen. Not just to be isolated and live out by yourself, but the truth is God didn't call creation very good until there were two people on the planet. When there were two people on the planet, then it was very good. The Bible tells us that God created Adam and he said it's not good for man to be alone. He created a woman, then it was very good. And the truth is that it wasn't about uh, Adam having a wife. It was about love needing to go somewhere. We weren't created to be alone or do life isolated. And I really believe there's something over this place to, to make Jesus famous and to help make every person be seen. Make people be seen. I see you. And you matter. And so... Whatever that means to you guys, I was praying for that. I really feel those are a couple of things that are over this house. And um, as I, before I get into what's on my heart as far as a message is concerned, I want to kind of say hi to you on behalf of my wife and my daughters. They're at home. Uh, they're wrestling with uh, some of the kind of uh, season change. We went from summer to winter. I don't know if you guys noticed that or not, but kind of skipped fall. And uh, it hit some of us a little harder. And so they're home with that and making sure that they're taken care of. But uh, you heard my wife on a, uh, singing a little bit earlier if you're here before the service. We have a CD with us in the back. And uh, you can take that with you if you want to. Check that out. I just have a few of those CDs. My wife is an incredible uh, musician and songwriter. So I think you'd really like those things. She also wrote a book. Uh, that's only in a PDF version. It's called Christ the Wonderful Counselor. We don't often think about Jesus as a counselor. Uh, but the Bible says in Isaiah that the name of the Messiah, one of his names, what he'd be known as is Wonderful Counselor. And Jesus took people who uh, were ruffians and had all kinds of issues and made them into world changers. And uh, so we, she kind of explores how did he do that in their lives. So... Uh, that's only a PDF version. It's on sale for like $5 right now. 
Uh, if you, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. If you want to stay connected with us, you can receive uh, some emails with just testimonies, things that God is doing in our ministry and lives. And um, if you uh, want to find out what we said about you guys and you want to sign up there and uh, see what's going on with that. But we, uh, if you're interested in her book, just write ebook next to your name on that sign up and we'll send you the link to be able to get that. Final thing I want to um, tell you about here real quick is our book. It's called The Basics in 21 Days. Just brought a few copies with us. Uh, this is a 21-day devotional that uh, helps people get a strong foundation in a new life with Jesus. And this is being used all over the world in all kinds of different settings. We have people that buy these in bulk and keep them in their vehicles as they lead people to Jesus. They want to have something that they hand them to. They're handed out to prostitutes, out in methadone clinics. Some churches give them to uh, anybody who gives their life to Christ in their churches. Some churches have used them uh, for their new believer classes or even their membership classes. Uh, I had one church that during Lent, uh, they required their whole church to do the book together, and they went through the book together as a church. So it's being, some churches have turned into year-long studies. They've been used in all kinds of different ways uh, but it's, it's, it's written simple on purpose. So this right here is supposed to be able to go so, to someone who doesn't have any church background. Because uh, Jesus called us to make disciples, not just make converts. The truth is, when you give your life to Jesus, it's the starting point of a new life, not the ending of a journey. And so because of that, uh, we want to make sure that people have something to be able to start that new life with Jesus and that Jesus has a purpose for your life. It's not just to make it to heaven. That's right. It's actually a purpose for your life now. And uh, this helps you start to discover some of God's heart for you and that kind of thing. Even as an area in the back here that I titled Christian Lingo. And you know we have our own subculture, right? And if you're not familiar with church, then many times you get lost in a church service. Like a uh, you know, what, is it, what does it mean when we say the word testimony? What does that even mean? If you don't know, I mean, you think you're in a court of a law, like I'm going to give a testimony of what somebody did wrong. But, you know, we have all these phrases and ideas. So this are Christian lingo it helps you survive your first church service and uh, kind of figure out what's going on around you. And so anyway, I uh, just want to uh, tell you about that. Just brought a few copies. Here's my question. Who here within the last six months, has given your life to Jesus? Back here? Okay, this book is for you. What's your name? What is it? Ryan. Ryan, Ryan I want to give this book to you. Come here. Step out of there. There you go. Welcome to the family, brother. It's an honor to meet you. You too. All right, so what I want to ask some of you here to do is to um, buy at least one copy. I just have a few. Uh, and with the, the belief that you're going to be handing that, that to somebody else who's going to help them, okay? Our ministry is called Life Ministries International, and uh, our pursuit is reaching the whole world and reaching the whole person. And uh, you can go to our website if you want more information. It is releasinglife.com is our website. And uh, so that's a little bit of that kind of overview for you guys and Check some of that stuff out if you want to. Love to stay connected with you and get, get to know you more along the way. Uh, but um, yeah, I had a great time with the people that came out yesterday. Had a pretty packed house. And uh, it was really fun being able to go into, into my passion. And uh, my passion, as it was mentioned earlier, my passion is to rob hell. The Bible tells us that hell wasn't made for people. And so you weren't made to go there. It wasn't made for you. And I love seeing people give their life to Jesus. By the mercy and grace of God, I've got to lead several thousand people into giving their life to Jesus. And we just kind of explored some of those things, coming at it maybe from a little different perspective, uh, as was highlighted this morning. Uh, some of evangelism courses that are out there, uh, they, they turn things into a script, and it's all about proving to people they deserve to go to hell. And uh, so... We learned how you can change a community just by understanding a simple game called Tag Your It. And uh, my assignment for those that were in the course is to try some things out 
on people, especially here in the, in the house, uh, but in your own lives as well. I had a, a fun time giving a prophetic word to someone at Starbucks this morning. You just never know what's going to happen because uh, the, the truth is you never knew what was going to happen when Jesus showed up because Jesus wasn't controlled by the fear of man. He didn't minister to people so that he would be accepted. He just was who he was. He lived. He didn't try to prove who he was. He just lived who he was. And then as he lived who he was, that brought an encounter with the reality of the kingdom of God. And then he interacted with them based off of how they were doing it. And so as you just live your life uh, the way that Jesus did, you never know what's going to happen in your life. You could just be going to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk and all of a sudden all heaven breaks loose. Lives are touched and changed. It's a beautiful thing. All right. So anyway, they'll help you out with that kind of stuff. We we'll also have an evangelism course that's online. You can do on your own if you go to releasinglife.com. If you want to grow in how to rob hell and find ways, I like to help introverts be able to reach out to people. And so if you find yourself as one who's an introvert, you kind of recharge by being alone and reading books, not by talking just because you're awake, then you're probably an introvert. And, uh, you know, I can help you uh, have some tools to, to just have a life where people are touched and loved on all around you. And so you can find that on our website. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So I, I like to tell pastors that evangelists are not long-winded. Pastors are actually long-winded. And uh, the, it's just that a pastor turns things into a series. <laughs> it's just one long sermon, but it turns into four, you know, turns into four messages. And an evangelist, you got to guess them, and they, you got to introduce themselves and talk about what their ministry is and say whatever they're going to say, administer to people all within your time frame. So, uh, bless my heart. I'm going to try to go into some things this morning. Uh, those were kind of preliminary things because. There's more that I carry than I have time to go into this morning. And there's many things I want to partner with you on that will really help your life, uh, that will really help you know God more and become who you're created to be in Jesus. And so I'm going to go after a little bit this morning, but please check out, you guys remember the website? What was it? Releasinglife.com. Check that out, sign up, because I would really think there's some other things that would really benefit you, you can pray about. All right, you guys good? You guys good? All right, good. I'm really excited to be with you and get into today's message. Uh, I came across this verse that we're going to try to explore. I'm going to see if I can find it. If you can go in your Bibles to, uh, let's see if I can find it here, uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. While you're going over there, we had somebody yesterday that was wrestling with some severe sciatic pain in her back, and uh, I haven't followed up with this morning, but last night she left and didn't have any pain. How are you feeling this morning? Yeah, you. She's feeling fine this morning, so that's so good. So she had some some serious sciatic pain, and uh, yesterday Jesus healed that, removed it. That's that's just like Jesus. John chapter one, you guys there? All right, I should have written this down because it's good to find a, find these verses. A hidden gem. I'm going to try to uncover hidden. Okay, hold on. John chapter one is a fantastic verse, or excuse me, fantastic chapter. Uh, but it's not there. Go over to John chapter 2. Maybe it's in John, John chapter 2. I recommend John chapter 1. It's a good one. Okay, John chapter 2. This is why the preacher should write down their notes. John chapter 2. Okay. It's not in John chapter 2. Oh, I found it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a beautiful gem. I recommend you read John 1, 2, and even 3. It's got some good stuff in there. Let's take a moment and pray. God, I thank you for your word that's true every time we open it. And I ask that you would give us the ability to understand what you're saying in our day and for us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John chapter 3, verse 16. Maybe you heard about it somewhere along the way, uh, but it carries a really powerful truth, and it starts with the foundation of what's on my heart to share with you. I have really, really good news for you. Even right now, we're in the Christmas season, and you have the angels that showed up at the, the time of Jesus being born, and so they have good news of glad tidings. That's for all people, right? And it's good news. It's found that Jesus was born. The Messiah had come here. We've, I, have, I want to tell you this good news of glad tidings, and it's simply this. God loves you. Let me say it this way. God loves you, and it's not your fault. It's good to know that you can be loved, and it's not your fault, because when you think you have some, uh, somehow earned the love of God, that would imply that you could remove it. Right. If it's something to be attained, then all of a sudden we're put in a position where we need to be good enough to have it. We need to have prayed long enough. We need to have done good enough things. But here, the good news that God wants to deliver in this place that the world needs to hear is God loves you, and it's not your fault. You are created with value and you can do nothing about it. It's not your fault you were created with value. You just were. Let me, let me try to unpack this just a little bit because it, this is really, really simple. I'm going to bring, I'm going to let the pastor be deep and sophisticated. I'm going to bring us really simple here this morning because if we get this, if we get this one foundational thing, it changes everything. It changes how we interact with people. It changes why we're friends with people. It changes why we want to get married. It changes why we want to get involved with things. It changes our inner, it changes what we put our lifestyles into based off of this one thing. That it, we are loved and it's not our fault. Let me say it this way. When my mom was 10 years old, Jesus came to her in a dream and told her that I was going to be born. And told her what to name me. That's pretty awesome, but that's not proof that God loves me. You see, the Bible tells us there's only one way that we can know that we're loved. It's found there in John 3, 16, and it's that Jesus came, right? So even in our own lives, a, if, if there seems to be a supernatural experience that is not proof that God loves us. There's only one way to know that we're loved, and how's that? That Jesus came. When I was born, the doctor said I wouldn't live to be five years old. I had an incurable blood disease. I was almost completely deaf. The uh, pastor that had officiated my parents' marriage uh, prayed for me. And I was instantly healed, completely restored, with no hearing problems, unless you ask my wife sometimes, and no incurable blood disease. I lived, obviously, past the age of five years old. However, while that's amazing, and I celebrate that, and God's mercy is so good, that is not proof that God loves me. How do I know God loves me? Because Jesus Came. You see, if we experience a healing in our lives, that's not proof that God loves us. There's only one way for us to know that we are loved, and it's by Jesus coming. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. When I was five years old, the Lord spoke to me in an audible voice and called me to preach the gospel. That was pretty fantastic. I, I didn't do anything to earn it. I was just five years old. Uh, you know, I mean, I was super cute, but other than that, I didn't do anything to earn that happening. But here's the thing. That doesn't prove that God loves me. How do I know God loves me? Because Jesus, I think you guys are starting to get this. That whatever, listen to me very carefully. 
Whatever we're called to do by God is not the determining factor of God's level of love for us. We're not called into ministry as evidence that God loves us. There, God did not say, I'm going to prove my love to you by giving you gifts in your life, by giving you talents, by calling you into ministry, by doing this thing. He's not saying, now look at that person. They're called to do this, and they have this certain level of gifting in their life. That's how I love them a little more than I love you. The evidence of our value before God is not found in what we're called to do for God. And it's not found in how we're called in the ministry or the gifts that we have, the talents that we have. Those do not determine, those do not prove that we are loved by God. There is only one way to know that we are loved by God. And how's that? Because Jesus came. When I was 11 years old, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I received an encounter with God that uh, lasted for six hours. The Lord just came upon me in power, spoke in other tongues. If you're not familiar with that, the pastors can tell you what that stuff is. It's in your Bible. Uh, For six hours. But that's not proof that God loves me. There's only one way I can know that I'm loved. And that's because Jesus came, right? Right? So even if we have powerful encounters with God, or we, see, or we don't, and we see somebody else that does, that's not proof of God's love for us. There's only one way that we can know that we're loved, and that's because Jesus came. When I was 16, I, I started preaching officially, uh, and it happened, it was on a Sunday night. The church had uh, youth run services once a month, and I got to preach in one. I didn't know what I was doing. I finished my notes in about five minutes, and I knew I wasn't supposed to be done then, so I kept going. But I didn't know what I was going to say. I just kept talking. I remember somebody after the service coming to me and said, I, rem- I noticed when the anointing kicked in. It was, uh, it was about five minutes after you started. <laughs> At the end of it, I didn't know anything about how to close a service. I didn't know any information like that. Uh, so when I got done, I was like, so I'm done. And turned it back over to the youth pastor who came up and asked everybody to stand and said, if you want to respond to what was just said here, feel free to come up and pray. And I remember standing off to the side, a 16-year-old, and there were about 200 people there. And about 80% of them, like, rushed to the front, crying out to God, weeping. I remember seeing a senior pastor turning around in his pew and just started praying. And I, and I was sold right then, to see lives that were changed. But even being called into ministry, seeing that happen is not proof that God loves me. There's only one way we can know that God loves us. Because Jesus came. I think you guys are starting to get this. And, and, and by the mercy and the grace of God, I have the privilege uh, of working in a ministry it's called Global Awakening, whose is very difficult to exaggerate the influence of global awakening uh, across the planet. It's literally in the history books already right now. It's influenced the world in tremendous ways. But being able to work in global awakening and be a part of what goes on there, guess what? That's not proof that God loves me. There's only one way for us to know that God loves us, and it's because Jesus came. Now some of you are getting tired of this message already because you're like, it just sounds like you're bragging on yourself right now. But here, we've got to get this thing right because we, we put things on God. It's almost like God's love is on trial every day, depending on how our day is going. If we get, if, if people notice us and want us around, then man, this is great. God, you really love me. I get a good parking spot. Jesus, just see me. Hallelujah. And <laughs> You know, if we have all these great things, we get the promotion that we want, we, we get the relationships that we want, we have the things happen that go our way, and we're like, God, you love us, but, but if they don't go that way, if you don't get that parking spot you want, you don't get the promotion that you want, you're driving down the road and your tire goes flat, God, where are you? What happened? Don't you see me? Get mad at God that as if he owes us something. And 
It's like we have God's love on trial. If, if I came from a good family, then I know God loves me. If I had things go my way, then I know God sees me and he's for me. But if it's not happening, that means God, the, the, the gavel has gone down and maybe you don't really love me. But see, the reality is God didn't put himself in a position of proving his love over and over again. From God's perspective, it's already been settled. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible tells us in this, God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible does not say, I will prove my love to you by giving you the best family that you could ever have. I will prove my love for you by making you the best looking person. I'll prove my love for you by giving you the most talents of anybody else around you. I'll prove my love for you by making you into a person with the best economic status or the most accepted ethnicity or that you'll be in a place where everybody likes you, everybody wants you. He never said, I'm, I'm going to prove my love to you. By putting all these things together, we can look at your own life, where you've come from, what you've walked through, to know that you're loved. Let me say it this way. When I was born, I had an incurable blood disease. But that's not proof that God doesn't love me. There's only one way for me to know that I'm loved. And it's because Jesus came. Let me, let me say it this way. I grew up in a family where my mom was married seven times. My dad was married three times. My mom was married to five different men. It was seven marriages. That's her own story. She's a powerful woman of God, but she had her own journey that she had to walk through. But I came from that background where there was abuse, where there was alcoholism, where there was drugs, and where we had around a neighborhood where I had friends that had abortions, and I was... 13 years old, trying to counsel people, going through all kinds of things. But that's not proof that God doesn't love me. You see, some people are waiting for someone to give them approval for their life in order for them to have courage to live. Or waiting for somebody to come to them and say that I see you and that you matter. And it's good to hear those things, but what, what's happened is we've taken our background and we've elevated it above the cross. Yeah. As soon as we take what somebody else said to us or did to us or didn't say to us and didn't do to us above the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then we have made those circumstances idols. We've made them our God. We need somebody to come and tell us that you're valuable above what Jesus did. But the truth is, from God's perspective, the trial is over and we can look to what Jesus has done to know that our life is worth living. Why? Because there was somebody who thought you were worth dying for. Why did Jesus come? If you ask many people, it's because I'm a sinner. Then we're missing it. Jesus didn't die for you because you're a sinner. Jesus died for you because you weren't created to be a sinner. The cross is a value statement, not a threat. God did not send Jesus because he was so angry at the world. God sent Jesus because he loved the world. Jesus died for you because he didn't want to live without you. Do you know how valuable you are? What would happen in your life if you lived like somebody who is worth dying for? How would you pray if you knew God actually wanted to hear you pray? How would you worship if you knew your voice mattered and no one else could worship God on your behalf? You're not just one little voice and one little peon among the many and you're on the outside looking in, but you're somebody who matters. You see, the Bible tells us that God gives us the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us. So that everywhere we go, God is there. Because He wants to be. No one's making God put Himself inside of you and be with you everywhere you go. God doesn't have little sticky notes up in heaven to remind Himself to love and care about you. He's absolutely crazy in love with you and He can't help Himself. 
He created you with value, and it's not your fault. See, Jesus is the ultimate demonstration of love. The Holy Spirit is a demonstration of how far away God wants to be from you. He didn't say build a building and come and visit me every once in a while. He said, I want you to be the temple of my spirit. I want to live with you and be with you and talk with you and us to have a genuine relationship together because I created you with value. I'm crazy in love with you and I want to do life with you. And some of us are trying to live towards God and forget he's already in us. He's with us because he wants to be there. Imagine what would happen if you interacted with God as someone who, who's already loved, already accepted. You're not trying to get your prayers to heaven somewhere because heaven has come inside of you. God is with you all the time. The most wise, most loving, most benevolent being to ever exist is on the inside of you because he wants to be there and he wants to do life with you. The God who has all the solutions for every problem the world is facing wants to do life with you because he's crazy in love with you. You're not a performer. You're not an actor. You're not someone who's trying to make their life look good enough for God to come to. You're not a photoshopped life. You're a lover. You're created with value. God loves you, and it's not your fault. You were born in the affections of God. So many of us, we live life trying to get love. And so we try to, we're friends with other people so that they're friends with us. Maybe you heard the old song. It's all about me, Jesus. It's for my glory and my fame. Wait, maybe that's not how it goes. Maybe I got it wrong. No, it's all about you, Jesus, for your glory and your fame. But when you don't know that you're loved, your entire life is about yourself. You see, there are some people that believe that what God wants to do is to crush you, to highlight how insignificant you are, and that's humility. Friends, I would suggest to you that what Jesus really wants to do is he wants to love you to death so that you can really be alive. He doesn't humble you by humiliating you and trying to highlight how insignificant you are. He humbles you by you being so satisfied with his love for you that you don't have to have somebody else like you in order for you to like yourself. Because as soon as you know that you're loved, then you can love other people with no strings attached. You can love them for their benefit and not for yourself. This is why Jesus was Jesus no matter who he was around. That's why he could hang on a cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do because he knew who he was and he knew if they really knew, they wouldn't do what they did. And some of us are living under a bondage of what other people did to us. And we're trying to find out who we are from them. But why should we give them that power? Why should we have somebody who's blind and deaf tell us who we are and who we're not? Why should we have people that have their own issues have the authority to tell us how valuable we are? But we live our lives that way. Some of us have even developed our own personalities to protect ourselves because we feel worthless. And our whole personalities are defense mechanisms. But here's the beautiful thing. The cross of Jesus, Jesus coming into the world, even this as we enter in this Christmas season, it levels the playing field for everyone. Your value is not based off of where you've come from, Your value is not based off of what somebody did to you or didn't do to you. Your value is based on the price that was paid for you. And it's humility to believe that you're worth dying for. It's humble to say, God, 
you died for me, you counted me worth that price. And so I must be something pretty special if the King of Glory didn't want to live without me. He chose you. He wanted you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're God's dream come true. You have nothing to prove. It's your privilege to believe that you're loved and to live life as a loved person instead of living life looking for love. The people get married so that it can be evidence that they're worth being chosen. Somebody chose me. All they're trying to do is have somebody show that they're valuable. It's all about me again. I get married for me. What if you're a friend with somebody because you actually like them instead of just in hopes that they'll like you? <laughs> what if you got married because you loved somebody and wanted to share life with them, not because you wanted to prove that you're worth being around? Just a thought. Some of us spend so much worrying about what we look and how people accept us and what's going on in our lives just so other people will accept us. What if we're already accepted and we let what's on the inside come out? Here's my, my ending point related to the message today. You guys heard my passion is to rob hell. I want, I want people to know Jesus. Uh, the, the world needs to meet Christians that know that they're loved. The world needs to meet Christians who have died to themselves. Not from the way of you're awful and deserve to go to hell, but from you, you've died to the need of somebody else being whole in order for you to be whole. See, Jesus lived from his identity. And he didn't require other people to not have issues in order for him to not have issues. Do you know you're not required to have issues? It's totally okay. If you have issues, fine. The Holy Spirit's really good at helping. He's making us more and more like Christ and we're going from glory to glory. But being a human being does not automatically mean you have to have issues. Some people have so much faith, they have more faith in us having issues than they do in Jesus setting us free. And Jesus said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Maybe he's actually good at it, if somebody will believe him. So as we go into this world, the people around us, need to meet Christians who aren't performing. We're not doing their Christian service, not doing their Christian duty. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. No, the world needs to meet lovers. It needs to meet people that when they pray, they know God cares. Not just because God loves everybody, but because Holy Spirit's in me because He wants to be there. He's excited about my life. And there's nothing I can do about it. What I can do is embrace it and believe it. My life matters. My voice matters. What's happening around me matters because God made it matter. They need to meet lovers, not performers. Let me tell you about the one who loves me. Let me tell you about the one who loves you. The world needs to meet happy Christians. There are so many people walking around with a sour, sour face like they've been sucking on lemons or constipated and they're like, serve Jesus and you can be like me. <laughs> Nobody wants to be like that. You know, the Bible says Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his brethren. In other words, you walk into a room, how can you find out who Jesus was? Look for the happiest guy there. If he had more joy and more gladness than anybody else around him, he probably had a smile. <laughs> right. 
Jesus celebrates the day that you were born. You're his dream come true. What would happen if you lived your life as a, I am a dream come true. God was longing for the day that I was born. My life matters. When you live knowing you're loved, it doesn't make you arrogant. It makes you free. I'm not intimidated by you because I don't need you to like me in order for me to like me. And when you can love other people as someone who's already loved, you don't need them to like you in order for you to like yourself. You're free. God wants to set us free from ourselves so that we can bring the message of freedom to the world. All right. In just a few minutes, we're going to close out the service here. See, some people are already shuffling out, so forgive me for going long, but I can't turn this into a series. <laughs> so we're going to close here in just a minute. I want to offer to pray for anyone who wants to hang around who can, because I believe God wants to do a fresh uh, baptism of love. Yeah. I can't pray on you intimacy with God. You have to develop your own relationship with God. All I can do is expose the truth that you're invited to intimacy with God. You don't have to earn it. He wants it. It's his idea. Life becomes a lot simpler when we believe God's ideas are right. When you pray and you spend time with him as someone who he wants around, it changes the way you pray. I can't make that happen for you. I can pray for a fresh touch of his love in your life. And we're going to do that for anyone who goes. But before we do that, I want to ask you for just a moment, if you would just take a second here and close your eyes. I want to ask you a question here. I'm just having you close your eyes so that you can just focus on my voice for a minute and not anybody else that's around you. Maybe there, I don't know the people here or where you're at with God, but I want to ask you about your relationship with God. I want to ask you this question. Everyone listen, please. I want to ask you if you're right with God. Let's not talk to each other, please. Let's listen for just a moment. I want to ask you if you're right with God. Maybe there's some people here that you gave your life to Jesus a long time ago, but if you were to be honest, you know you're not living for God now. I'm not talking about you had a bad day or a bad week, so to speak, but you know you're not living for God. Today's a really good day to accept the love of God and get things right with him. Maybe you're here and you've never asked Jesus to be in charge of your life. You may not know this, but God has a purpose for your life and it's not to just exist. You're not an accident. He's got things for you to do and he's got someone for you to be. And it starts with you asking him to be in charge of your life. That's what I call getting right with God coming into a relationship with him where you're saying, I want you to be in charge and I want to live for the reason I was made for. I want that. In just a moment, if you're either one of those categories, I want to pray with you. If you're somebody here that a long time ago, sometime back, you gave your life to Jesus, but you know you're not living for God, you want to get things right, or if you're somebody here who says, you know, I don't know if I've ever really done that before, but you want to, you want to give your life to Jesus. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if one of those categories are you, I'm going to ask you to put your hand up so I can see it, so I can pray with you. There's not a magical, magical formula to this. Uh, it is literally just saying, this is what I want. I want to get things right with you, God. And this is your chance to do that today. It's a great day to do it. When I get to three, if you want to get things right with God, let me see your hand. 
One, two, three. Lift your hands. Let me see him. Lift him up a little higher. He's got several hands all over. Okay, awesome. You can put your hands down. Now, I recognize those are two categories. I don't know your life, but I want to pray with you about getting some things settled with God today and getting things right. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you if you were serious about what you did. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand where you're at. And I want to pray with you there. And uh, uh, this is a chance for anybody else who said, you know, I should have raised my hand, but I didn't. I want to ask you to jump in on this if you're serious. And I'm only asking this for you uh, if you're serious about it. And I'm going to ask the pastors to watch you, look for you, so they know who you are, because they want to celebrate you. And so this is only for people who really mean it. You want to get things right with God. Either you know you haven't been living for God and now you're getting things right, or you never have and you want to get things, you want to give your life to God. There are many hands that went up. You won't be the only one standing. But if you're serious about it, or you know that you should have raised your hand and you didn't, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to stand to your feet now. Come on. Come on. If you mean it, stand to your feet. There are even more hands that went up. Cool. All right. So as I said before, there's no magic formula to this. It's literally just talking to God. And so I want to help you talk to God about this. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say a few words in prayer. And I want everybody here, whether you're sitting or standing, I want you to repeat these words. But you're not talking to me, you're talking to God. As we get into this, again, one more time, if you feel like you're supposed to be standing, now's your chance to do it. Don't let what somebody else thinks about you keep you from entering into the love of God for you let's all pray this together it only matters if you mean it in your heart let's pray God I come to you in the name of Jesus I thank you for loving me I thank you for proving it by Jesus coming I receive your love for me and I give you my life. I ask you today to forgive me for everything I've done wrong and I thank you for completely forgiving me. I give you my past. I give you my present. And I give you my future. I draw a line in the sand. And I cross over. I say today. That Jesus Christ. Is my Lord. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus came to earth. Lived a perfect life. Died on the cross and rose from the dead. I thank you today for who you created me to be. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and be my best friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Now those that are standing, I have one final question before we close out the service. I want to ask you to look at me and let me know a nodding of your head, a wave of your hand or something if you meant what you prayed. Because it only matters if you mean it. There's no magic formula, no magic words. Awesome. Since you meant what you prayed, then things are right between you and God. And I want to encourage you to receive more of what God has for you through the pastors here can help you grow in that and to talk to God as someone whose life matters I thank God for you you're amazing 
I want to ask everyone, please, to stand to your feet. If there are no other announcements, I want to close us in prayer. And if you need to go, you'll be officially dismissed. If you would like to receive prayer, fresh baptism of the love of God, fresh touch of God's love in your life, uh, I'm going to ask you to remain here. And we'll have you here in the middle aisle. I just want to say some, a quick prayer for those people who want a fresh touch of God's love in your life. But when I say amen, you are free to head out the doors as a loved person. Live your life loved. And you're also free to come here in the middle aisle and just kind of line up on, on the outside here. And I'm going to come and pray for you either way. If you really, really did not like today, and you're new to the church, I won't be here next week. So don't give up on the church based off of that. If you really, really enjoy today and God touched your life in some way, then know your pastors bring in amazing people and come and try them out again. It's a great church to be a part of. I'd really like to welcome you home. Let's pray. Papa God, I thank you for these amazing people. I thank you that you counted them worth dying for and that your love is settled. We live life with the expectation of your best, not because you owe us something, but because Jesus came. We live our lives as loved children, not as employees of heaven. You are not our heavenly boss that we're filling out a time card for. You're the lover of our souls who can't get enough of us. And God, I declare to you that we love you back. You have loved us so richly. You've given us breath to breathe, a life to live, and we give it back to you. Let us live as loved people to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name. I bless these people. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. You're dismissed. If you want to stay for prayer, just come right here to the middle.